everybody, hope you're well. Today we'll read from a book titled Leandro Valencia Loxin, Filipino Architect by Jean-Claude Girard, published by Birchhäuser. Bruno Marchand wrote, I often like to compare architectural research of a historical nature to detective work. The parallel is both amusing and enlightening. With the skill of Sherlock Holmes, the researcher must, hypotheses formulated, chase after clues and interpret them, find exhibits, spend entire nights searching through dusty archives, the objective being to obtain evidence to better grasp the facts and ultimately to clarify the enigma or solve the mystery. Even if the object of their investigations differs, researchers and detectives adopt a similar approach to obtain convincing results. In both cases, such an approach implies a scientific method of investigation made up of exact observation, an assiduous search for information, the organization of data, and rigorous reasoning based on a certain knowledge. This parallel is particularly relevant in the case of Jean-Claude Girard's research on Leandro Loxin. He has been familiar with the work of the Filipino architect for some time, but during a sabbatical stay with his family in Manila in 2013, the discovery in situ of some of Loxin's uh, breathtakingly radical creations had the effect of an electric shock, triggering an immediate need to know more about the originator and about the inspiration behind such architecture. Loxin is certainly a well-known architect with a long career, numerous achievements and a perfectly justified reputation, recognized by his peers and rewarded by prizes. Even though his career has been the subject of a few publications and academic studies, it is clear that no research has been based on a systematic and exhaustive examination of his office archive an approach that is essential for a historical and theoretical understanding of the architect's work and thought. The availability of drawings, photos, models and administrative documents among other materials from the Loxin family, as well as access to the library and even to some of the architect's personal objects, allowed Jean-Claude Girard to begin work on the basis of material that was largely unpublished, consisting of a set of primary sources that had never been assembled before. But, as is often the case, the archive is neither complete nor completely reliable, and doubts remain about the interpretation of certain documents. It is at this point that we can return to the aforementioned parallel with Sherlock Holmes. Donning his detective mantle, Jean-Claude Girard conducted an investigation to fill in these gaps. He had to find other sources, cross-check them to verify their validity, hypothetically reconstitute a more exhaustive list of works, go in search of undocumented objects, consult maps and satellite views, visit and visually appreciate the sites, photograph them, etc. All this in order to respond to the imperatives of historical investigation, to document, to attribute and to date. Although fastidious, this methodical and meticulous work has notable virtues. In this case, it has brought to light new avenues of understanding and new critical perspectives, resulting in part from the confrontation of the designed and built work, with remarks made by the architect at the time of conception. For Jean-Claude Girard, it was a question of stracing unknown paths and correcting or enriching existing knowledge. For Loxin's work is complex and refers in particular to the intersection of different languages and cultures, Filipino of course, but also Japanese and Western, above all American. While architects profile their production through the prism of the art and architecture of their time, it should be noted that Loxin's generation is particularly receptive to American culture, assimilated through the assiduous reading of recognized magazines, which document the latest achievements of the masters, sometimes still at the project or construction stage, or through travel. 
among the preferred destinations was the United States, the new focal point of modernity in the post-World War II period. Luxin went there in 1959. His encounters with Philip Johnson and Eros Arinen in New York and Detroit, Paul Rudolph's work at Yale and Frank Lloyd Wright's at Taliesin and West were fundamental in their impact on his work. As Jean-Claude Girard demonstrates, this trip firmed up Luxin's choice of reinforced concrete as a material that stands out for its potential suitability to Philippine culture. During this trip, he was successively confronted with Johnson's classicism and formalism, which he adapted to various religious or administrative buildings, with Wright's organicism, transposed in particular in the Domestic Spaces program, and with Sarinen and Rudolf's plasticity, which he interpreted with virtuosity. However, another initiatory journey must also be mentioned, the trip to Japan in 1956 and the visit to some of Kenzo Tange's works. A moment of great introspection on the importance of tradition and the vernacular and the difficult synthesis to be made with the modernity of contemporary projects. These influences lead us to detect an affirmed mannerist tinge in Luxin's architecture, rooted in the work of the great masters of the first generation and some of their followers. But to proceed in the manner of is not limited to simply copying. On the contrary, it gives us the possibility to measure the originality of a work in relation to its model. This way of proceeding is neither systematic nor unequivocal, often assuming contradictory aspects by correlating, for example, traits of certain models with others belonging to other formal systems. When he confronted the American form givers, as historian Rainer Banham calls them, Luxin revealed his own sensitivity and ability to adapt the essential features of such architecture to the local, social, economic, but also climatic contexts. There remain nagging questions that he could not and did not want to avoid. What is the identity of Philippine architecture framed in an emerging hyperglobalization? What is his own cultural and artistic vision of this same identity oscillating between extremes, the vernacular on the one hand and modernity on the other? For any architect, these questions are fundamental. For Loxin, they were all the more compelling because he obtained, at a precise moment in his career, public commissions of great magnitude, which were meant to represent the predominance of political power and the affirmation of a new national and institutional collective feeling. It is certainly important to anchor these projects and achievements in a historical and thematic understanding of the facts. Throughout his work, Jean-Claude Girard has done so, revealing to us in this book new connections through chosen words that have structured his thinking as a researcher. This double-profile historian-architect must be underlined here, for it is not enough to get hold of unpublished archives. One must also confront the in-depth study of the material, technical and functional characteristics of the architectural objects with particular attention to the details, the implementation, the materials used and their own quality. The reading of historical documents was thus accompanied by another reading, sensitive to the materialities, an approach that is always edifying and which proves fundamental in the case of the strongly plastic and tactile work of the Filipino architect. Beyond this plasticity, diverse and complex, remains the feeling of the continuity of the work. It is forged from the same radicalism and abstraction, from the same expressive and rational minimalism, from the same care of the treatment of materials and details, and finally, from the same exploitation of the sculptural springs of the architectural forms. As Jean-Claude Girard shows us through this book, Leandro Loxin remains today one of the most singular and fascinating architects of his generation. 
ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.